Welcome to graduation day. So I just have a couple quick announcements uh, before we get to the bookends graduation. Um, first thing I'd like to say is uh, tomorrow's salon at Soham Patel is going to be hopefully outside. Uh, we're really lucky. Uh, her publisher shipped us some of her books that are coming out in August. So we get them before anyone else. Um, but because of that, it, it can't be put into it, entered into the bookstore. So they'll be sold for cash. I know that cash is the obscene word these days, but uh, um, it's, I think it's going to be $20. Uh, there's an ATM somewhere on campus, I'm sure. Uh, no, it's in the student center. Um, tonight we'll have um, Susan Scarf Merrill, Frederick Tutton, and McWalter reading. It's going to be in here as well because we just don't know what's going to happen with the weather. If you like what you hear today and you are get interested in the bookends program, tomorrow at lunch there's going to be an info session in the salon tent. We have a quiz, sweatshirt, four words. 
mirrors, surrealist, library, labyrinth. Who said it? There we go. Okay, there we go. Two sweater is perfect. Okay. So this is a really special night uh, because we get to celebrate uh, our year-long bookends program run by Susan Scarf Merrill and Meg Walter. And so I'm going to invite uh, Susie up to, to do introductions there. Susie Merrill. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Carla, Bob, and Paul. And especially thank you, Meg and Jen and all of our mentors who would have thought that our scrappy little program would ever boast 56 alums, which we will do in about 40 minutes. <laughs> so, but here we are. <laughs> so we're here to celebrate the accomplishments of Bookends Fellowship Six, a marvelous and varied group of writers. Each fellow will be introduced by their mentor, beginning with my colleague, Molly Gaudry. Please join me in celebrating all of them. All right. So it is my pleasure to introduce Bobby Crace, one of my very, very favorite emerging writers on the face of this entire planet. All right, Bobby's manuscript, The Blue Testament, is itself a testament to his love of language and story in equal measure and to his deep understanding of the fragilities of the human heart, resulting in characters who are, by turns, endearingly huggable, frustratingly smackable, and always, across the board, created with the kind of care and devotion that makes them vividly and lastingly unforgettable. Um, thank you, everybody. This is from uh, Blue Testament. Uh, from up above, the town of Oak Bluff looks like an apostrophe trying to claim possession of some oak woods lining the Ohio River Valley. On the ground, the town is split by train tracks that run right down the middle of a dirt road that some folks call Main Street and other folks call Train Street. Now, Grace Pearson owns a home on one side of the dirt road, and Miss Posey Dunn owns the house next door. Both of their porches are painted brightly, and they like to hang competitive laundry to dry in the front yard. Now, across the street are two shops, Maud's Diner and Pop's Everything Store. Maud and Pop both call the dirt road Train Street, but disagree about everything else. <laughs> now, the tracks dividing the town are used by freight trains en route from Charleston to Cleveland, and engines hammer through Oak Bluff at irregular intervals, but one day, a hungry conductor decided to stop and try the Chili Mac at Maud's Diner. And that lunch break created a tradition where conductors would sporadically pull the brake at Oak Bluff, causing a run on sentences of 40 boxcars full of stuff that Oak Bluff can't have. And it'd stop and throw up the most sinister soot and diesel smoke. And as the soot rains down, Grace usually runs screaming from her house to rescue the laundry, while Miss Posey calmly retrieves her clothes off the line. Possum is the only one who can tell that Posey her pace is rushed. And across the street, that crumpled ginger, who calls himself Possum, sat in the alleyway between Maud and Pops, and his head filled with questions like, how long had it been since Junior Teller had died, and what would Oak Bluff look like if he had lived? Thank you. There's an order. There's always an order that I don't know about. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to be up here today. When I read Katie Aspill's novel in draft, I was immediately struck by the contrast between its prose and aesthetic. 
The writing was dazzling, bright for its detail and color. The sensibility was dark, really dark, and sort of wondrous for its commitment to its own darkness. That was the starting point, our starting point for so many conversations this past year about all the fun things in life, pacing, structure, and how we go about increasing each other's capacity to feel. I suspect I learned more these past few months than Katie did as I watched her novel evolve into this gorgeous and perfectly balanced thing about abuse and self-care, orthodoxy and resentment about love and narcissism and how two extremely unlikely bedfellows struggle to surmount their histories and their worser selves. Strike Another Match goes places that most novels won't and the result is, an ex is a reading experience that takes us where we don't normally go to that place where, to paraphrase a little bit of Chekhov, we confront ourselves in service of the opposite. It is my huge pleasure to introduce Katie Aspel. Thank you, Fiona. I'm going to tell myself that every day. Um, thank you all for listening. <clears throat> Clem belched. The lumberjack special was sitting heavy in his gut. Three eggs, three sausages, three strips of bacon, and he dropped a hand below his desk to loosen his belt. Better. He glanced over at his partner, Jenny Fish. She was a muff diver, the first one Clem had ever met, and had short hair and big, ugly shoes. Not that Clem knew about fashion. She was on the phone now, nodding and mm-hmm-ing, then turning the receiver into her shoulder and sneaking a bite of pie from the clamshell on her desk. A radio crackled somewhere, the operators dispatching a two-man unit to look for some old fart who'd run away from a retirement home. Clem reminded himself for the umpteenth time that he should go see his mom. It was easy to put off. If she wasn't telling him he looked husky, she was complaining that he never visited. His half-brother down in Chicago seemed not to feel any guilt about keeping his distance. His chest twinged. Maybe it was indigestion. Clem needed to write a report about a pillhead who had stolen a flat-screen TV from the Walmart Supercenter. He was grateful to be spared the cutbacks that were happening at the auto plants downstate. He was grateful for the paycheck that enabled him to keep his mom in the old folks' home. He just wished it didn't mean so much paperwork. Clem had joined the force because he had thought that being a cop was the closest he could get to being a superhero. Turned out that was firefighters. <laughs> yes, Clem was feeling sorry for himself that morning, and he hadn't even thought of his ex-wife yet. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Susie and Meg and Jen, and thank you, writers. I've learned as much as I hope I've given. Um, and a, th a thank you especially to my writer, Shadi, who taught me so much this year. Um, her wonderful novel, Dancing with the Enemy, just transformed my January to May, uh, really inspired me every week. I, I can't say enough about it. Dancing the Enemy opens with a little girl trying to make sense of the Islamic revolution in Iran, and most crucially, her own father's role in the resistance. 30 pages later, the little girl has transformed into a vibrant young woman who falls for a mysterious CIA operative and I know the daughters are here, but also into some pretty steamy encounters. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. And it's, <laughs> I'm blushing, sends her on a thrilling global search for her beloved father. Amazingly, there's a little footnote. In March, during Shadi's work on the novel, news broke of a 40 plus year cover up of the rigged release of American hostages that tanked Jimmy Carter's reelection helped Ronald Reagan take credit for freeing them, and of course, ascending to the presidency. Iranian culture, intrigue, betrayal, plenty of romance, and an up-to-the-minute plot, not to mention Shadi Mir herself, 
a little girl who bore witness to a revolution in Iran and her father's role as the Shah's foreign minister. Here she is with Dancing the Enemy. Thank you for coming. I'll be reading from the beginning of the novel. I didn't learn until later why Papa was so drawn that day. It was a cloudy spring afternoon. I was back from school. Papa wasn't supposed to be back from work until about 8.30. He used to come home for lunch, take an hour nap, then go back to work and stay until dinner time. That afternoon, he didn't look at me as he came into the foyer. Drasvite papka, I said, as it was custom to greet each other in Russian ever since Moscow. Papka was my nickname for him. He had a nickname for everyone, but only I dared to have one for him. Natasha, my governess at the embassy, kept saying that it was disrespectful to call Mr. Ambassador something as menial as a folder. But adding ka to the end of a word in Russian also denotes something small and cute. And after all, he was my papka. But that day, he didn't return my greeting with his customary Drasvita Kuska Mukuluska, a bunch of sounds he had strung together that pleased him. Mm -hmm. I watched confused as he set down a heavy stack of books on the dining table, then went back to the car and returned with another armful of books, and then a box of files, and finally a box filled with desk supplies. On top was the envelope opener engraved with his initials that the premier had given him and a photo of him and me that he always kept on his desk at the foreign ministry. I wanted to ask him what was going on. Why was he so sad? But before I could, get out of here, my mother hissed. I knew better than to disobey. My father had a temper, so I went up to my room and started my schoolwork. I was in fourth grade at dual language school, Farsi in the mornings and English in the afternoons. So it took several hours of homework to keep an A average. Over the next few days, I learned about what happened in bits and pieces, mostly from eavesdropping on my mother and my aunt. Thank you. Suzanne Lefetra found this story the hard way, which is the best way, through firsthand experience, tireless research, and imagination. By transforming parts of her own experience into fiction, she's made something really interesting, a big, powerful story that reminds me in its sweep and sense of humor and intelligence of one of my favorite books, The Corrections. Lucky Girl is just as funny, knowing, and surprising. In Suzanne's story, it's the mid-1990s, and like in Franzen's novel, there is a very specific and unique family story. And like in Succession, the family business is a character in this story. And like in Succession, there is a question about succession. <laughs> Amanda is the young woman at the center of things, and Karina is the controlling matriarch, and Adam is her castrated son, and Stephen, Amanda's brilliant brother, is the wildly unpredictable, uncontrollable counterforce trying to move the family business south of the border to take advantage of NAFTA. The book is close to being finished, and I'll be there when it is. I'm so excited to see what Suzanne does with it next. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Hi to my family on the West Coast watching. I'll be reading from the opening of my novel, Lucky Girl. The Fisher family gathered around Corinna Fisher's massive holiday table, long enough to seat an army, which, in a sense, the Fishers were. A ravenous, pale-skinned, marauding army clad in the armor of capitalistic ambition, which had been buffed to a high gleam over three generations. Amanda Fisher scooted a chair out for her grandmother, who lowered her scrawny Chanel-clad bottom into the newly reupholstered Queen Anne, which had cost more than Amanda's college tuition, which was saying something since she was paying full sticker price at USC, majoring in, what else? Business. <laughs> Sitting around that well-adorned table, the future looked bright for the Fishers. Square-jawed, clear-skinned, well-mannered, and civic-minded, they were the epitome of a prominent family. Corinna Fisher and her long dead husband had founded High Fidelity Audio Speakers Inc. in the 1950s, catching the early tide of the music boom that would come with the gyrating motions of Elvis's hips, the soul inflaming rhythms of James Brown, 
and the bouffant puffed beauty of the Supremes. High fidelity speakers were celebrated as some of the best in the world, highly engineered, top flight, blue ribbon. For the rest of the family, the business was a revered big brother, MVP, perfect teeth, prom king, eagle scout. High fidelity was like the sibling you looked up to, the one who blocked out the sun, casting everyone else in shadow. Here's to our good fortune, said the matriarch, holding her glass aloft. And there were the fishers, toasting one another on that darkening Christmas evening, with their collective straws all poked into the same river of wealth, sucking madly. <laughs> Well, it's uh, been my great pleasure to work with uh, Esperanza Cintron, and um, I have the honor of introducing her. And to make sure I got it right, I uh, wrote this out. And... Watch out, man. <laughs> Watch out. All right. In an age when, at least in progressive circles, we are asked to understand the plight of those unlike ourselves, but also told to stay in our lane, when we are told to appreciate, but not appropriate, other cultures. When sensitivity and diversity are the order of the day, but the use of the word empathy is attacked as being presumptuous, a writer might find him, her, their self too nervous to put pen to paper or type a single sentence. In this fraught atmosphere, Esperanza has dared to write I Don't Swoon, which imagines the lives of formerly enslaved African-American characters as well as white characters, queer characters, and Spanish-speaking characters in a different era, the years following the end of the American Civil War. Better yet, I Don't Swoon gives us not one-dimensional walking political opinions, but flesh and blood people, men and women whose principles and desires sometimes clash, whose passions cross the lines of so-called race. Inspired by Esperanza's daring, I dare to use the word empathetic to describe her vision of this richly imagined world. The novel could be described as both a romance and a murder mystery, genres that fuse in Esperanza's capable hands because the greater mystery involves the human heart. Please join me in celebrating Esperanza and I Don't Swoon. over with, right? <laughs> okay. Day one, just before sunrise. The Reverend Cletus Jenkins was stretched out in the front yard of Miss Maddie's whorehouse. He was stiff like that wooden Indian the Virgil Parker sets outside his general store every morning. The preacher looked like somebody had shoved him off the porch with the business end of a heavy boot and he landed splat on his back. Sarah imagined he wouldn't have gone down with a little bounce like the wooden figure might have. The Reverend would have flailed a bit before going down hard, his backside kicking up a cloud of dust. The sinner in Sarah felt a little tickle of laughter at the thought. Cletus Jenkins was a mean man. But she had been brought up to be a Christian, and the part of her that couldn't shake that training made her recognize the thought was shameful. She soundlessly scolded herself as she stared down at the pale face that was nearly hidden by the tall grass. A righteous woman strives to be charitable. The words were almost a mantra. She had heard them so often when she was a regular at the little lean-to church back east. But even though she knew she was given in to, the lesser, to her lesser self, she allowed herself a grin. Seeing the preacher doused in liquor and splayed out like a weed decorating the front of a front yard of a brothel and titled even the most devout Christian to a little fun. <laughs> she, she leaned in a bit, legs braced, ready to jump back and run if he was playing possum. He was out cold, still as a log. The sourness of liquor rose up to snatch at her breath. She could see his eyes through the loose lock of blonde hair. They were open, staring at nothing, and his mouth was wide with surprise, like he wanted to say something, but the words got stuck. 
sucking in a breath, Sarah swallowed the lingering bit of glee she had been feeling. It wasn't right to think ill of the dead. And Cleta Jenkins sure enough looked dead. <laughs> That was amazing. Um, uh, my name is Eve Gleichman, and it is my real uh, pleasure and privilege to introduce Katie Callahan, um, who I've gotten to work with over the last year um, on their book called The Flicker, which is an incredible book. Um, and I just want to say, um, aside from really admiring Katie as a writer, um, their writer is their their writing is truly exquisite and funny and smart. Um, but also Katie is an incredible editor and um, I just really admire your commitment to revision and to um, uh, completing a novel draft, which is from personal experience, just the hardest thing anybody can possibly do. Um, <laughs> uh, the Flicker is just like the coolest book ever. Um, um, it is based around the premise that in the Coachella Valley, every once in a while, for no clear reason, um, everybody en masse disappears temporarily um, before reappearing seconds later, minutes later, hours later. Um, and in Katie's novel, two women who are having an affair find themselves in the Coachella Valley when one of these disappearances or flickers happens, um, except that they are the only ones who do not disappear, um, <laughs> which is uh, it presents an interesting predicament for the two of them. <laughs> um, it is my real uh, pleasure to bring Katie up to the stage. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eve, and thank you all for being here. Everybody was gone. Lolo and I stood in the hotel breezeway facing the pool where everybody was gone. Blue and white striped towels and oversized canvas bags were left behind. On round plastic tables between lounge chairs, cell phones lay unclaimed and full drinks sat undrunk. Agave and planters reached toward the center of the empty courtyard. The sun had not yet set, but everybody was gone. In the restaurant, purses hung on the backs of chairs. A bee landed on a half-eaten tamale, and there was no one to wave it away. I saw an empty stroller and a cloth toy wet on one corner. We went to the street. Moments ago, we had been alone in my hotel room. We had been inside, entwined, and had not seen the people vanish. I think everybody's gone, Lola said. <laughs> Excitement unfurled in my stomach. I opened my mouth and took in air, but didn't speak. I ran to the corner and faced the main road, empty. I felt giddy. I looked back at Lolo, who was in her loose tank top and shorts, standing on the sidewalk, her long, dark hair a curtain. But I saw her as she had been in my hotel bed, splayed open hips and mouth, head tossed back to show the inside of her front teeth. <laughs> I'm Rachel Paston, and I am thrilled to introduce to you Faye Engstrom and her wonderful novel, Suffer the Children. This engrossing and beautiful book is a hospital drama, a love story, a coming of age tale set against the backdrop of the 1980s Church of the Latter-day Saints. Our guide here is Rachel, one of the first Mormon women enrolled in medical school in Utah, she is stubborn, tender-hearted, confused, ambitious, determined to be both a skilled practitioner and a good Mormon wife and mother. 
As we spend a long overnight shift with Rachel in the neonatology ward, we watch her learn to get a ventilator working on a preemie no bigger than an eggplant, grapple with misogyny and exhaustion, and get more involved than she should with a teenaged mother who reminds her more than a little of herself. Part of the pleasure of Facebook is in the details of the strange dream world of the NICU with its procedures and rituals and humidified air. And part is in watching Rachel learn that hard choices are inevitable in the hospital and in life, but that she has, in the end, the strength to make them. Faye. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for listening. The cry of a feeble old woman coming from a baby was frightening and surreal. Rachel fidgeted, waited for Paul to take her hand, invite her into the brisk dance of resuscitation. She was a senior medical student rotating through the neonatal ICU. He was a senior pediatric resident and knew best when to let her watch, when to let her try something new. With hurried practiced hands, he wiped blood and amniotic fluid, fluid from the tiny face. The baby's tongue quivered between stretched lips like a hatchling's begging to be fed. Rachel took a step back, crossed arms tight across, against her chest. Sure, she wanted to learn, needed to practice, but maybe not on this child, no more than 20 minutes old, no bigger than an eggplant. One so fragile that a butterfly landing on her shoulder could send her right back to God who gave her life. The mother of the baby, Monica Lamb, was little more than a child herself. Still up in stirrup, she looked through the soundproof window separating maternal delivery room from neonatal treatment room. She twisted her head this way and that, stretched, strained to see what no one especially wanted her to see. Rachel moved to block the girl's view, then wrapped an oxygen probe around the tiny foot setting it aglow like an iridescent red jellyfish. Meanwhile, Paul gathered supplies for intubation. The premature brain, smooth as a lima bean, would soon forget to tell the lungs to breathe. The child needed help, rescue. Mm -hmm. Paul lifted the intubating laryngoscope toward Rachel. Her heart raced. Intubation was the only thing she'd never attempted on one of these tiny scraps of life. A mantra passed through her mind. Make a mistake? kill a kid. She took the scope. Thank you. When the bookend staff connected me to Sarah Mayer de Stadelhofen, they told me I would see right away why. Only a page in and I knew they were right. But anybody who loves good sentences and complex psychologies carefully observed would have gotten a charge out of these pages. This is a case not of a book finding the mentor it deserves, but perhaps of a mentor finding the book he doesn't quite deserve, but is grateful to get. I thought they knew I could sink my teeth into this and delight in it, and delight I did. Sarah and I dove in and I asked her to do some heavy lifting and rearranging its component parts. And rather than overturn a table and storm off, she bellied up to that table, virtually, of course, and dug in. I'm um, reminded of something the great Mark Richard liked to say in a workshop I was in years ago. I love it. It's perfect. Now let's fix it. <laughs> what she did was find a way to combine its disparate parts into uh, an order that allowed the reader to fall helplessly into Sarah's effortlessly good storytelling. Sarah, in this book, The Miraculous Catch of Fishes, is doing for Geneva what other writers have done for other cities. She is... <clears throat> Uh, she is situating it on the literary map and pl planting a flag for it as a site of fascination. The city springs to life in full dimensionality in its, in its living color, in the sublimity and agony of real life. This character-driven novel achieves real pathos in its depiction of lives in states of conflict and crisis, and it quickens the pulse in, in capturing some of the, peaks, the peak dramatic moments in those carefully observed lives. It's also a social document that casts an anthropological light on the stratifications of a Genevan society that is at a crossroads for the world's cultures and economic situations at a moment of inflection in late stage capitalism, when demographic shifts and changing mores suggest not just a, a Genevan, but also a European world that is evolving towards something captivatingly different from what has come before. And it's all in these pages, so enjoy.
Ludo had worked the flea market twice a week for over 30 years, but he'd never forgotten his first day. Just turned 18, just released from juvie for burglary, he showed up one Saturday morning with a cardboard box under each arm. Soon he found he liked everything about the flea market, the sun on his face, the freedom to set his price, the chance to put his quick eye to a new lucrative and legal use. From boyhood to middle age, Ludo watched the market change as one generation made room for the next. Bereaved family members in a hurry to empty an apartment would first call in the antique dealers, then guys like Ludo to pick over what was left. Once prized possessions passed through his hands, but now the stream of heirlooms was drying up. Now he relied on another source of inventory, the sidewalk. Every neighborhood had a day each month when residents could dump stuff. And since Geneva was a revolving door of well-paid people from all over the world, you never knew what you might find if you got there before the garbage trucks. Ludo knew what to expect from every neighborhood. The poor ones not to bother with, the rich ones with consistently good pickings. Yet one evening, he stared out of his van in disbelief at the Voltaire armchair, mid 19th century walnut, original red velvet upholstery, sitting outside the high walls of a patrician property like a daughter cast from a family. Eight years later, he still had that chair, was still waiting for his price. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I am Christina Baker Klein. I'm so happy to be here. What an incredibly inspiring um, event. I love that we do this. It's so wonderful. Thank you to Susie and Meg for creating this out of thin air. So what a pleasure it was to work with Stephanie Nellen this year, Steffi, as she's known, as she revised her promising novel, now titled The Dream Thief. I once asked my own editor, Catherine Nenzel at William Morrow, what she thinks separates a writer with a viable long-term career from a flash in the pan. She said that when a writer takes her edits as a springboard, a starting point, rather than as a checklist, and revises the manuscript in surprising and original ways, she knows there's hope. Steffi entered this program with a fully fleshed out draft that was already incredibly suspenseful and darkly funny. Over the past six months, she took my paltry suggestions and transformed her manuscript, bringing it to an entirely new level. She's the real deal. I'm so proud of her and the work she's done, and I can't wait to watch her soar. Steffi, take it away. I'm going to read from the beginning of my novel. 6 p.m. Yellow pushed aside a stack of cognitive psychology assignments and from the height of his fifth floor window observed his colleagues filing out of the building. He wanted nothing more than to join them, to breathe fresh air instead of coffee fumes and copy machine ink, to hug his partner Timo and little Floris before lifting a lid of one of the pans and asking, what's for dinner? He wanted to enjoy Floris' last night with them before the boy went back to his mother in five days. Instead, Jelle did what he had to do, though the sequence of steps felt increasingly pointless. Step one, open the spreadsheet labeled daydream. Ignore the anger paralyzing your fingers and the fact that each click and keystroke makes you feel nauseous. Stare aggressively at the array of data without blinking until the details mercifully blur. Yella nibbled at the tip of his right pinky finger then remembered it was a bad habit. His stomach churned with panic. In one week, he would have to give a talk before yet another committee to convince them his research was worth funding. 
This time, a VD grant was at stake, the name an allusion to Caesar's famous announcement. As a defending graduate student, he'd failed to get a Veni grant. Making the final round of the VD was as close as he'd ever come to seizing a sizable chunk of grant money. The interview was his last chance to save his tenure review, his last chance to keep his job. He needed a result, any result. He had nothing. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Lincoln Michelle, and uh, when I first read Rose Afriere's out oh, there, <laughs> um, draft of Project Motherland, I was struck simultaneously by the novel's big imaginative ideas and its attention to the smaller human core. Project Motherland is a globe-spanning speculative epic taking us from historical Africa and Europe during the transatlantic slave trade to a future America where courtrooms are run with AI lawyers and you can travel the globe with virtual reality tech. But amidst these large science fiction concepts and big themes, Project Motherland never loses sight of the smaller yet most essential thing, the human heart. Deborah, Charlene, Nana, and the other characters are rendered with care and complexity. And we learn about their struggles and hopes and different circumstances in ways that deepen the novel's exploration of history, family, race, and the limits and possibilities of technology. It's also a lot of action, magic portals, and a lot of other fun things. When we started working together, Rose already had all her pieces as well as the board. Our time together was figuring out how to arrange those pieces, the adjustments of pacing, POV, and plot beats. Throughout our time, Rose's enthusiasm for writing in general and her passion for this project in particular were really infectious. And it's my great pleasure to introduce you uh, or introduce Rose and allow her to wow you with a chapter from Project Motherland. Thank you, Lincoln, everybody for listening and being here and to the entire bookends program. It's just been a dream come true. I am reading from my speculative fiction novel project, Motherland, chapter three, The Whale of Life. Daddy is just asleep, Keontae said. We just need to get to a hospital. We haven't done anything wrong. Keontae was still in his private school uniform, now rising to his full height. At 10, he was tall for his age and had a five o'clock shadow in the light, but unmistakably, he was just a boy. Why are you coming closer to us like someone is in trouble? You should be trying to help us, Keontae said to the police. One police officer, the color of rich cognac, came close to Keontae and Deborah on her porch and said, you have to come with us, ma'am. There is enough probable cause to bring you in. His badge read the name Ado. Now your son is a minor and he doesn't have to see this. Again, ma'am, I'll repeat it. Is there someone you can call? A relative? Anyone? I'll call my sister, Deborah said, as she blurted out before she could make sense of all the words. After she dialed on the virtual pad, Charlene's face appeared on the screen. Charlene screamed, why are you calling me? Charlene, I need your help, Deborah said, as she sank into herself. I made a big mistake and I need you to come and get, I figured I'd hear from you, not to say hello, not to say you are sorry, but when you actually need something. Deborah swallowed hard and felt the sadness weigh on her shoulders. She knew the grudge still stood, but hoped she might at least get a word in. Charlene, but I told you I never wanted to hear from you again. And you know what? 10 years later is still 10 years too soon. Don't make me get a restraining order, Charlene said and hung up the phone. Deborah couldn't tell if she was numb from the cold or the abrupt cancellation of the call. Charlene was right. She had needed something now and called, but she could have at least heard her out, even after all these years. Deborah looked up to the face of the officer. She could feel the eyes all around her, judging her. Mommy, you have a sister? 
Before Deborah could answer, she felt the grip of a strong arm and a voice that followed, which said, you'll have to come with us. Thank you. Uh, I'm Karen Bender, and I'm thrilled to introduce Miranda Shulman um, and her novel, I Used to Love You. Um, and I want to start with a lot, one of my favorite lines from this novel, which is about the Park Slope Co-op. Not, not the whole novel, but just this one line. <laughs> Park Slope Co-op members, while unsuspecting behind their hemp aprons and their labels of middle-aged, stay-at-home mom, dad, lawyer, teacher, and their facade of their reasonable passion for organic food were a bloodthirsty, tyrannical mob, <laughs> always hunting for freeloaders and defectors among them. <laughs> this is just one of the many great lines in Miranda Shulman's hilarious dark novel, I Used to Love You. A look at friendship, sisterhood, loss, envy, ambition, longing, power, the small and dramatic town of Park Slope, dog kennels, and ultimately the challenges of growing up. Whether Miranda is describing the complex social dynamics of Park Slope Co-op or the complexity of sibling dynamics, she does it with a clear, original, wonderful eye for the absurd. To see Miranda take these characters and develop them, trust the humor and the wildness inherent in this journey was an utter joy. The way this novel became itself visible Funny, deeply honest was a revelation. I Used to Love You is a new and utterly original contribution to the literature of friendship and transformation and sisterhood. And I'm thrilled to introduce her novel to you. Oh, I'm speechless, which is really inconvenient. Um, <laughs> um, okay. An hour before her twin sister's memorial, Chris wept over a half-empty jar of Kalamata olives. She should have been on a train, hunched over her notebook, hand metallic from graphite as she sketched to pass the time. Instead, she lay on the kitchen floor, holding the refrigerator door open with her knee. Goosebumps pinched her arms as scenes from what must have happened played in her mind like a nightmare. Fingers breaking the jar's years-old seal, the near silence of jostling olives, Rosalie thinking she'd gotten away with stealing one, maybe two, couldn't have been more than that, unaware that she'd left behind evidence, a droplet of purple brine the size of a penny on the counter. I'm so sorry, Chris whispered to the jar in her lap, breath clouding the 13, de oh my God, the 36 degree air. <laughs> she stayed that way, blue lipped beneath the humming refrigerator until her sadness changed. She trusted Rosalie enough to give her the room chosen her out of all the people from Craigslist who toured the apartment. This new sadness picked Chris up off the floor, pushed her toward the bathroom, and raised her arms overhead. Jar clasped in her hands, she imagined hurling it into the tub, the satisfaction of Rosalie's blood spiraling down the drain after stepping on broken glass the next time she showered. <laughs> what the fuck? Audrey's voice cut through her reverie. Tears of relief spilled from Chris's eyes at the sound of her sister's voice. By the time she lowered her arms, they were numb and pale. She wandered back to the kitchen, cradling the precious jar in the crook of her elbow, whispering to it as she removed a single olive herself, the first she'd ever taken, which she zipped into her pocket. She secured the lid, twisting with all her might until she was shaking, then pressed the jar deep into the corner of the refrigerator where it belonged positioning it so that the label upon which she'd written her name in Sharpie faced out. <laughs> Hi, I'm Meg Wallitzer. Um, it was a great, great pleasure and an ongoing delight to have the chance to work with the wonderful Craig Holt on his winning and wildly original novel, Not Much of a Hugger. 
<laughs> when I think of Craig, the word open comes to mind, for he was always open to changes, including the kind that Grace Paley suggests in her title, Enormous Changes at the Last Minute. <laughs> Craig was receptive and focused, moving finely conjured pieces around in the service of his project, always thinking hard and rethinking. But more than that, he was open about his protagonist, Randy Gunderson, a man whose need to not change gets in his way. How do you write about a person who drives away the people he wants to hold close? Craig can show you how. He is as funny a writer as he is a compassionate and knowing one. And as for knowing, this book is filled with extraordinary understanding about apple growing, marriage, regret, and the sudden appearance of a disturbing hole in the ground. I already feel a kind of hole in my life, no longer working with him. <laughs> Truly, I do. And I am so excited that you will get to hear a little bit of his beautiful book. Wow. Um, <laughs> Susie, Jen, Meg, thank you so much for this. My amazing cohort, my incredible pod. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. It's so much more fun to read to you than to my cat. Um, <laughs> Randy doesn't get it. Stepping into his barn apartment after another sad Thursday at Brews, he stumbles. Banging his shoulder into the door jam, he feels more than hears the tectonic boom of a minor earthquake. Beside him, his old red hound, Tater, yips in alarm. Randy crouches to pat Tater's side and rub his floppy ears for a calming moment racing for another jolt that doesn't come. He stands again with a grunt. Better check on the house, he says to Tater, pulling the key off the nail next to the front door. The dog barks and bounces on his front paws, always eager to explore the old place. Randy moved into the barn five years ago after the accident and his night in jail. On that unfathomable day, he'd stepped into the late summer heat of the Wenatchee police station parking lot, dug his phone from the Ziploc bag, and dialed. While it rang, he'd closed his eyes and tipped his face to the sun, as though in prayer. He'd meant to ask about their son Tim's injuries, but when his wife Marcia picked up, he said, it's not my fault. She said, we're not coming back. They've spoken over the years since then, brief conversations about the division of assets and the closure of shared accounts, the bland legalese crackling with her disdain, his grievance, but she stayed on the west side of the Cascades, three hours away in the damp and dark of Seattle. She never came back for her clothes, the furniture she'd made, not even for a toothbrush. I could load up the truck, he offered once, weeks after the accident, bring her things. We could talk. She said, keep it, sell it, burn it. As though their home were a place where she had endured some protracted illness, a pestilence that lingered on surfaces, as if she were afraid of reinfection. Thank you. Amazing. They were just. I need, I need one of those fans and some vapors. Listen, thank you. Um, thank you to our wonderful writers and to our extraordinary mentors. And thank you to this audience um, for coming today. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Thank you. Thank you so much. So mentors books are for sale. Um, and uh, because there's so many of them, you may have to hunt them down to get uh, autographs. Uh, please join us tonight for our reading, which will again be in this space. Thank you.